The opioid epidemic is, I would say, at this point, one of our greatest public health challenges in this country. Over 70,000 people died of an overdose in 2017. And that was the most ever recorded in American history, much greater than even the number of deaths due to HIV-AIDS at the peak of that epidemic in 1995. So the magnitude in terms of mortality is overwhelming, to say the least. We now know that much of the origins of this epidemic are in the pharmaceutical industry and in prescribing of opioids to levels that I don't think anyone had ever anticipated. We see pharmaceutical companies, manufacturers pushing these medications, marketing them very aggressively, and trying to expand, basically, the market share of these drugs to conditions where such strong pain medication normally wouldn't have been necessary. That just exposes a vast number of people to these. At the same time in the 90s, there was a push on physicians to think of pain as a fifth vital sign and to treat pain very aggressively. And this, at the time, was what many physicians pulled off the shelf to do that. And now we're seeing the outcome of all of those come together. So unfortunately, the medical community, pharmaceutical companies ultimately, I think, created this crisis, and now it's just manifested to levels that I don't think many people actually expected. The fact that the world needs forms of renewable and clean energy is no secret. Fossil fuels pollute and cause environmental damage, moreover they are running out fast, so we need alternatives. One such alternative can be wind energy. Wind energy has already made a vital contribution to our energy needs. The windmills of our forebears have been transformed with modern technology into the electricity behemoths that are helping to power the grids of countries all over the world. The advantages of wind power are many and compelling, but here are some aspects of wind power production that cause concern. There is no denying that wind turbines produce noise, and if you live near them, this may be a problem. The sound they produce can travel, some estimate up to 2 kilometers. Another disadvantage of wind power is that wind is not constant. In fact, it fluctuates both in strength and direction. The man who coined the term vegan is Donald Watson and that was in England in 1944. Before that, vegetarianism was, you know, something that was related mostly to religious beliefs and spiritual beliefs and also a notion of healthism, like perfecting the body, which was often promoted by sort of religious advocates. Donald Watson wanted to distinguish between people who were eating meat and the people who were eating eggs and dairy, and he felt that we should not consume any animal products, not just dietary, but also wool and other byproducts, leather, etc. And so he coined that term in 1944. And by that term he meant a lifestyle that encompasses, you know, avoiding any harm to other beings. That's the origin of the term vegan. In the 1970s and 1980s, in England and then increasingly in the US as well, veganism became part of what's known as the animal protection movement or the animal rights movement, and it became like a means to an end. In order to help animals, people would adopt a vegan diet. And what's happening now is veganism is emerging and sort of being disassociated from, that to some extent, and becoming its own distinct, what I call, lifestyle movement. While you might find yourself wondering why my memory is so bad, forgetting is part of life and people forget surprisingly fast. Research has found that approximately 56% of information is forgotten within an hour, 66% after a day. The reality is that while the brain is capable of impressive feats, its capacity to store and recall details is limited. There are different reasons due to which we forget things. To start with, have you ever felt like a piece of information has just vanished from your memory? Or maybe you know that it's there, but you just can't seem to find it. This inability to retrieve a memory is one of the most common causes of forgetting. Sometimes people forget due to a phenomenon known as interference. Some memories compete and interfere with other memories. When information is very similar to other information that was previously stored in memory, interference is more likely to occur.
One of the differences between social network sites and text messaging is that social network sites are public or semi-public. So you might be having a conversation with one person through say status updates and comments, but there are a lot of people who are potentially listening. And that changes the dynamics a little bit. One option on a site like Facebook is to put people into groups or lists, so you're actually targeting specific people and this may be increasingly done as Facebook develops. However, research suggests that people don't necessarily want to do that, either because they don't trust the technology or because it's not nuanced or sophisticated enough. So people will adopt other strategies to address certain people. So for example, you might use song lyrics or references to events or to people so that certain people are excluded and other people realize they're being talked to. Another strategy is to tag people in photos, even when it's not a photo of them, and I think that's part of that sort of attempt to carve out your own little community within the social network sites. And what we're looking at is how people use language choice to target particular people. So they will choose to use one language or another. So English is often used to target a wide audience across language groups but multilingual speakers will then use local languages to target specific groups within that. Yellowstone became the first national park for all to enjoy the unique hydrothermal and geologic wonders. The broad array of habitat types found within Yellowstone contributes to a high diversity of bird species, including many whose migratory travels bring them back to the park each year from winter journeys south. Yellowstone National Park forms the core of the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem, one of the largest nearly intact temperate zone ecosystems on Earth. Greater Yellowstone's diversity of natural wealth includes the hydrothermal features, wildlife, vegetation, lakes, and geologic wonders like the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone River. An amazing experience awaits you here. In spring, plowing begins and roads and services open for the season on a staggered schedule. Records of bird sightings have been kept in Yellowstone since its establishment in 1872. These records document nearly 300 species of birds to date, including raptors, songbirds, shorebirds, and waterfowl. Approximately 150 species nest in the park. Yellowstone is as wondrous as it is complex. What is deforestation? You might know it as the loss or destruction of natural forests, which has taken the shape of a major global problem not to mention that it has far-reaching environmental and economic consequences. We all know that trees are natural consumers of carbon dioxide, as they help absorb CO2 from the atmosphere through photosynthesis. The destruction of trees not only removes these carbon sinks, but the practice of tree burning and decomposition pumps even more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Did you know that 70% of the Earth's land animals and plants reside in forests? That's something for you to take note of. But many species of flora and fauna are on the verge of extinction. Do you know why? The answer is obvious. Deforestation. Over 80% of the Earth's natural forests have been destroyed. The annual net global loss of forest area between 2000 and 2005 was over 7 million hectares per year. That is an area about half the size of England. Despite these staggering statistics, deforestation continues to happen on a massive scale. Much of the deforestation that is occurring today is in developing economies that consider it necessary for their development. These countries feel that developed countries cut down their forests centuries ago and reap the benefits from this deforestation, and it is unfair to deny developing countries the same opportunities. A special thing about typhoid fever, specifically with typhoid Mary, is that the carriers may have no symptoms because the bacteria are lying in their gallbladder. And those people can infect other people, as they may be shedding the bacteria unknowingly. And that's the story of typhoid Mary. So, her real name was Mary Mallon, 
and she lived between 1869 and 1938. Her name has become synonymous now for anybody that spreads a disease. She was an Irish immigrant to the United States. Around 1900, she started working as a cook in the New York City area. What started happening was that the people she was cooking for were coming down with typhoid fever, some very wealthy people, among whom typhoid fever would really be unheard of. A major investigation traced it all back to Mary Mallon. Investigators figured out that Mary Mallon wasn't herself sick, but she had a gallbladder that was full of the bacteria. They asked her to take the gallbladder out. She refused. So, she got put on North Brother Island and had to basically live her life there in quarantine with a court order. In 1910 she was released because she agreed to never cook again. But, she changed her name and started cooking again, causing another outbreak, and had to be quarantined again. This whole time she kept refusing to have her gallbladder out. Had she agreed, she wouldn't have needed to be quarantined. Fertilizer runoff could increase the number of frog deformity cases in North American lakes. The first such case was found when schoolchildren studying wetlands found a high number of frogs with missing or extra legs. There are a number of theories as to the cause of these malformations. Some said pollution was to blame, but in 1999, a Stanford professor showed that a flatworm parasite was a major culprit. When these parasites are low in abundance, they do not cause much damage. But, he now believes, fertilizer pollution may be to blame for boosting the number of parasites in these lakes. Runoff from non-organic farms have great amounts of nutrients from fertilizers, such as phosphorus and nitrogen, that enrich the waters nearby, that is known as eutrophication. Since the industrialization of agriculture the amount of phosphorus going into the ocean has also increased, which can stimulate the growth of algae. The professor experimented by populating algae with frogs and aquatic snails in phosphorus-rich lake water. He found boosting the growth of algae eventually increases the number of the water snails. If there are more snails, the parasites are more likely to find a snail. The snails once infected, release the parasites. The parasites then attack the frogs at the tadpole stage, infecting the cells that affect the frog's limbs. The discovery of deformed frogs has caused concern for the survival of their populations making them easy targets for predatory birds. There are different means through which dolphins survive in the oceans. From the blubber to their ways of communicating and finding food, dolphins have adapted to their surroundings. Characteristics such as their system of defense and means through which they obtain oxygen underwater make them the true survivors in nature. A number of threats exist in the deep ocean, sharks being one. But the dolphin's built-in defense system, such as their long nose, provides them the ability to kill sharks, besides helping them communicate with each other. Like us, dolphins too need oxygen. They always have access to oxygen. Before diving underwater, Dolphins gather air through their blowholes and close them up just before the descent to keep any water out. In deep oceans, their heartbeats slow down. That causes blood to flow from other areas in their body to fill their lungs, brain, and heart with oxygen. They can also utilize their muscle tissue to store oxygen. Now, dolphins locate food sources through echolocation. By bouncing sound waves off their prey underwater, they know what they have found. They then use their teeth to catch the prey. Then, there's blubber, that acts as a protective coat for dolphins, enabling them to maintain warmth even in very cold water temperatures. It also streamlines their physique, making it possible for them to swim at very fast speeds through the ocean. <laughs> 